So this is what I study. I study the human brain, and it's only three pounds, but it's the most complicated device that we've ever found in the universe. So the human brain contains about 100 billion neurons. Neurons are the specialized cells of the brain. And each one of those is about as complicated as the city of Puebla. Each neuron has the entire human genome in it, and it's trafficking millions of proteins around. And each is connected to about 10,000 others, which means you have thousands of trillions of connections. So it's impossible to understand a system of this size, but one thing is totally clear, and that is that you are your brain. All of your hopes and your dreams and your aspirations, your decision-making, the agony, the ecstasy, everything about you is somehow contained in this three pounds of wet biological material. Now, how do we know that? Well, imagine you were to damage your little finger in an accident. You would be sad about that, but you wouldn't be any different as a person. But if you were to damage an equivalently sized chunk of brain tissue, that can change you entirely. That can change your risk aversion, your decision making, your capacity to speak language or understand music or name animals or see colors or any of a hundred other things that we see every day when people get even very small brain damage. And that's how we know that you are your brain. Now the part that got really interesting to me when I was studying this in the laboratory every day is the fact that essentially all of who you are is running underneath the hood of your conscious awareness. So what I mean is I had a cup of coffee at the break and when I lifted the cup of coffee to my mouth, that action is totally invisible to me. I have no idea how I got the coffee to my mouth. All I know is whether I spilled it or not but it's actually underpinned by a lightning storm of neural activity at this level. At this level that's really quite alien to us, right? And it's not just lifting a cup of coffee, it's everything in your life. It's recognizing a friend's face or falling in love or driving a car, getting a joke. Everything we do has lightning storms of brain activity that we're not even aware of. And so this is what led about a century ago to this idea about the un conscious, the stuff that's happening below your conscious mind, the conscious part of you, think about it as the part that flickers to life when you wake up in the morning. That part's the conscious you, but essentially everything that you do and act and believe, these are all generated by parts of your brain that you have no access to and very little acquaintance with. So think about what it's like when you when you have an idea and you say, oh, I just thought of something. Well, it wasn't really you that just thought of it, right? Your brain's been working on that behind the scenes for hours or days, consolidating information, putting things together, evaluating that. At some point, it serves it up to you and you say, oh, I'm a genius. But it wasn't really you that thought of it in a sense. Okay, so this is what led, for example, Carl Jung to say, in each of us, there is another whom we do not know. Or as Pink Floyd put it, there's someone in my head, but it's not me. <laughs> so let me give you an example of this. There was a study done some years ago with, um, by the way, is it possible to get my slides up here? If we can do that, that way people wouldn't have to look at the side. Thanks. Um, some years ago, um, psychologists did a study where uh, they asked men to rate the attractiveness of women's faces in photographs. So the men would just look and rate from one to 10 how attractive they thought the woman was. Here's the important part. In half the photos, the eyes were dilated so that the women's uh, pupils were larger. So it turns out that the men uniformly rated the women with the dilated eyes as more attractive. But none of the men noticed that and said, oh, I noticed her pupil was a millimeter larger here. And importantly, Presumably, none of the men knew that dilated eyes is a biological sign of sexual readiness in women. But their brains knew it, and here they were, making the right sorts of decisions that they had no awareness of why they were doing it. And love always goes this way, right? You find yourself more attracted to some people than others, and you don't know why, but the why has to do with deeply carved evolutionary programs that are running in the background that you're not acquainted with. And it turns out that unconscious influences in our lives 
uh, can be pulled out statistically with large groups of people, and they can run deep. I'll just give you a quick example. It turns out if your name is Dennis or Denise, you are more likely to become a dentist. Now, you can prove this to yourself by going through the dental registries. This is probably a terrible reason to choose a career, but it turns out that uh, we like things that remind us of ourselves. People gravitate towards that. And if you were to ask any of these Dennis's or Denise's why they became a dentist, they would have a whole conscious narrative about it. But that would miss the reach of these unconscious drives. And by the same token, it's not just career, it's things like personal relationships. It turns out you're more likely to marry somebody whose name begins with the same letter as your name. So Joe and Jenny, or Alex and Amy, or Donnie and Daisy, you can go through all the marriage registries and prove to yourself that this is true. And again, it's outside of the conscious reach of the people who are doing this. They wouldn't imagine that there are other things that drove them to, to, to this life mate. But, but there are many things running below our, our radar. Uh, I'll just give you one example of the way that your brain can know things and do things that you don't even know. So I'd like everybody to put their hand up on their steering wheel. So go ahead and everybody put your hand up on your steering wheel. And I'd like you to make a lane change into your right lane. So you're driving in the center lane, and I want you to move over into your right lane. So go ahead, go ahead and do it. Make your lane change. Okay. Okay. Well, I didn't see anybody use their blinker, but maybe in Mexico it's different. But... <laughs> Okay, but as far as I could see, as far as I could see, everybody did it wrong. So everybody I saw turned the wheel to the right and then back to center. Okay, so what you've just done is you've steered your car onto the sidewalk and into the building. You've just crashed. The way that you actually do a lane change is you turn it to the right, back to center, just as far to the left and back to center again. That's what a lane change looks like. And you do it every day, and you don't even know how you do it. But your brain knows. Okay, so what this means is there's this enormous gap between what your mind has access to and what your brain is doing underneath the hood. There's a big gap there. Okay, and so I want to circle back around to how I started here, which is there's this very strange thing happening, which is that we're made up of this essentially alien biological material, and yet that is related to everything about our behavior and our perception and our reality in ways that we don't have access to. And what I want to tell you about now is the way that this has major ethical and societal implications. Okay, so I'll just give you an example. Some of you may know this name, Phineas Gage. In the late 1800s, um, there was an accident that happened where there was an explosion, and as a result of that, an iron rod blew through his head and landed 50 yards away. And the reason it became a famous medical case is because he didn't die. He didn't even lose consciousness. But what happened is his personality changed entirely. And people who knew him said, Gage is no longer Gage. He went from being a nice guy to now being a, a mean person who would cuss and drink and gamble and sleep with prostitutes. He just became a totally different guy. And this was the first example in the medical literature where people really started getting straight about this issue that you are your biology, and if your biology changes, you change who you are as a person, fundamentally. Now, in the intervening 130 years, we've had lots of Phineas Gages. So, um, here's an example that some of you may know. In 1966, Charles Whitman climbed to the top of the tower at the University of Texas in Austin, and he started shooting people randomly, and he killed 14 people that day and wounded 39 others. In an totally random act of violence. So when the police finally got to the top of the tower and were able to kill him, everybody wanted to know, who is this guy? Well, it turns out the only thing more surprising than the act of violence was the fact that there was really nothing about Charles Whitman that would have predicted something like this. He was an engineering student. He worked uh, part-time as a bank teller. He was very high IQ. And so everybody tried to figure out what had happened. Well, they went to his house and they found his diaries. And it turns out that for the previous year, he had been writing about this issue that he had this anger that he was trying to deal with. It was becoming more and more intense. He went and saw a psychiatrist. He didn't know what was going on, but he was very smart and articulate. So he wrote about this very clearly. And he said, I'm supposed to be a reasonable young man, and yet somehow I'm 
unable to control this anger. And he wrote a suicide note before the shooting, and he said, when all this is over, I want an autopsy to be performed. And that's exactly what happened. They took his body to the morgue, they performed an autopsy. What they discovered is that he had a tumor growing in his brain that was pressing on a part of his brain called the amygdala, which is involved in fear and aggression. Now, not everybody with an amygdala tumor goes on a mass shooting spree, but did it have something to do with his act? Almost certainly yes, in the same way that when Phineas Gage's biology changed, so did his decision-making and his personality. Here's a more recent case, a man who's 40 years old, normal sexual behavior, and uh, he started becoming a pedophile. He's got a, a great interest in child pornography, and he tried to do something with a prepubescent girl, and his wife had him arrested. And when he was in prison, waiting for sentencing, he was having such bad headaches that they let him make an emergency room visit, and he got a brain scan, and it turned out he had a massive tumor in his frontal lobes. He had a massive brain tumor. So there was an emergency surgery, this was removed, and his sexual behavior returned completely to normal. He, like the rest of his life, had no more interest in pedophilia. Now, six months later, he started having an interest in pedophilia again. So his wife took him back to the doctor. They found the tumor had been regrowing. They took it out a second time, and his behavior returned to normal. So again, you are your biology, the decisions you make, the kind of person you are. And of course, people have known this for millennia. People put alcohol into their system to change who they are. All kinds of invisibly small drugs change you. This is Chris Benoit, who was a worldwide wrestling federation champion, went home one night, killed his wife and his son, and killed himself. And upon investigation, it was discovered that he had eight times the normal levels of testosterone because he and his doctor had kept injecting him with hormones, and he was having a roid rage, which completely changed who he was. Um, and this can happen with pharmaceuticals too. This, uh, about a decade ago, it was discovered that many patients with Parkinson's disease were becoming compulsive gamblers, and they were blowing their whole family's fortune in Las Vegas or online. And it turns out that the drug that can, um, can improve the motor symptoms of Parkinson's also changes your risk-taking behavior. And so it takes these sweet elderly people with Parkinson's disease and turns them into gamblers. So something as fundamental as the, the kinds of decisions you make can be changed by little drugs. Okay, so I think what this means is that nowadays when we talk about morality and decision making, we're really talking about the neural basis of it. And this leads to this very deep question about free will. Is the mind something that's separate from the brain or is, are they the same thing? Does the mental equal the physical? And the fact is when you look at these issues about what you find attractive and your personality and your decision making and everything else I mentioned, it becomes clear that if something like free will even exists, it's the smallest player in the whole game. And so we are tied to our biology and this, is a, this leads to a very deep, thorny question for our social justice system, which is how do we think about culpability? So our current legal system rests on two assumptions. The first one is that we are free to choose how we act. We're practical reasoners. And the second is that all brains are equal. Now that's a very charitable assumption, but it's demonstrably false. Along any axis that you measure brains, whether that's aggression or risk-taking or impulse control or anything, you find there's a huge spectrum in the population. And that's because we come about as a confluence of our genes and our environment, and that sends brains off in very different directions from the very beginning. So brains are like fingerprints. Everybody's different. Now the problem is, with these assumptions that the legal system makes, they don't align well with neuroscience, but the deeper problem is, it leads us to use incarceration as a one-size-fits-all solution. And in my country, America, we have the number one incarceration rate in the entire world. We put more of our people behind bars as a percentage than any country in the world. And it turns out that the estimates now are that 30% of our prison population has mental illness. This isn't the right place for us to be putting our mentally ill. It has low utility and high cost, and fundamentally, what we've done is turned our prison system into our de facto mental health care system. So here's the thing, as we get better biological insight into what makes everybody different, does that lead to people getting off the hook? Does that lead to exculpation? The answer is no, it's not about that at all. It's about rational sentencing and customized rehabilitation. 
and how to design realistic incentives on a population scale. Because we care about the differences between brains, we all care about things like tailored education, so why not have tailored social policy, a system that's forward-looking and says, what's the best thing for us to do from here? Uh, this is a, a clip from Whitman's suicide note. He said, if my life insurance policy is valid, please pay off my debts and donate the rest anonymously to a mental health foundation. Maybe research can prevent further tragedies of this type. This inspired me, all of this together, to start a few years ago the Initiative on Neuroscience and Law, which has become a national movement now. It brings together scientists and judges and lawyers and policymakers to understand how science can improve the way we think about social policy. I'll just give you a very quick example. In America, we spend $15 billion a year on the war on drugs, and we do that by attacking drug supply. And any economist can tell you that that'll never work because supply is like a water balloon. When you press it down in one place, it'll come up somewhere else. If you really want to address the drug problem, you have to address demand, not supply. And demand is the brain of the drug addict. And we know so much at this point about the circuitry and pharmacology of drug addiction that my lab and others around the globe are making great strides in coming up with new techniques and therapies to help people break their drug addiction, which is a much better idea than mass incarceration. And, and drug policy is just one of the areas that the initiative works on. We also work on how neuroscience informs the insanity defense and juvenile sentencing and eyewitness testimony and even the brain of the juror, which is the other half of the equation about how we punish and why we're so driven to punish. And so collectively, I think what this gives us an opportunity to do is to take our insights about human behavior and import this into how we think about running our social justice system. So that instead of having something that's just driven by intuition and convenience, we can build a system that's evidence-based and forward-looking and make something better for humankind. And that's how we're setting out to change the world. Thank you very much.